The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to name your sins to God in the privacy of your priesthood, so that God the Holy Spirit might bring to your memory those things which we have forgotten. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. As we begin this basic lesson number two, may the things which we note become a source of blessing and challenge to us. In Christ's name, we ask it. Amen. Now, in the last message, we studied uh, salvation. We studied that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. We studied that faith is the only uh, system of perception which is totally devoid of any human merit. We also noted that the salvation work of Christ on the cross excludes anything being added to faith. We gave a definition of grace, and grace is all that God is free to do for unsaved mankind on the basis of the saving work of Christ on the cross. Therefore, as a matter of grace, salvation is entirely the work of God. It is the work of the Father in judging our sins. It is the work of the Son in being judged for our sins. And it is the work of God the Holy Spirit in common and efficacious grace. And of course, we studied common and efficacious grace. In common grace, the spiritually dead person cannot understand the gospel. Therefore, God, the Holy Spirit, acts as a human spirit that the spiritually dead person does not have. A spiritually dead person is considered dichotomous. That means having only a body and a soul. There is no human spirit. So therefore, in common grace, God, the Holy Spirit, acts as the human spirit so that the gospel might be perspicuous, understandable to those who are in spiritual death, who are listening to to the gospel message. And then if that spiritually dead person believes in Christ, that fe- that is called it. Then something called efficacious grace goes into effect. And that of course is when faith is made effective for salvation. And therefore we noted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Therefore, we noted that salvation is not by works. We uh, noted verbal works. We noted pseudo-repentance is uh, wrongly or erroneously construing repentance as feeling sorry for your sins. Therefore, you are not saved by feeling sorry for your sins. The word metanoieo means to have a change of mind. And in spiritual death, when, and this is a result of common grace, of course, because in spiritual death, you are completely unable to understand the gospel. The gospel is foolishness to those who have not believed in Christ. But under common grace, when the unbeliever is listening to the gospel, suddenly God the Holy Spirit makes understandable, perspicuous, acts as a human spirit to the unbeliever, and makes the uh, gospel perspicuous and that is the moment that such a person might have a change of mind metanoia which has been falsely translated repentance which has uh, no meaning in our language today as we noted therefore uh, we noted different types of uh, verbal works one type is an invitation Now, salvation by invitation does have a right connotation, but for the most part today, it has been used with a wrong connotation. The right invitation was made by our Lord. He invites us to salvation. The invitation to salvation follows the principle of coming to Christ, not inviting Christ to come to you. By believing in Christ, we come to Christ at his invitation. As per Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These words were uttered by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in John 6:35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. So note that Jesus Christ invites us to salvation. We do not invite him. John 6.37 The one that comes unto me I will certainly not cast out. John 6.47 He who believes in me has eternal life. This is our Lord's invitation to the spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead at the moment of our birth. We cannot invite 
Christ anywhere. He can only invite us, which he does through common grace. This becomes efficacious grace when we believe in Christ. And therefore, we noted that dead people do not issue invitations. A spiritually dead person can hear and believe, but only God the Holy Spirit can make the gospel perspicuous and that faith effective. Wrong invitations are blasphemous. A wrong invitation is defined as uh, Jesus Christ coming to you. In salvation, we come to Christ through believing in Him as per His invitation. There is no salvation by inviting Christ to come to us. The wrong invitation, therefore, can be um, divided into two different categories. The first is inviting Christ into your heart. The second is inviting Christ into your life. The reason for these blasphemous ideas, as we noted, comes from Revelation 3, 19 through 20, in which it, it, this is completely and totally misunderstood by pastors. And, it, and Romans 3, 19 through 20 addresses believers only. It is not an invitation to salvation. It is an invitation for the believer in Christ to utilize 1 John 1, 9. After salvation, that is, for those believers who are out of fellowship with God. And therefore we noted uh, Revelation 3, 19 through 20. Those whom I love, I reprimand, I punish. Therefore be zealous and repent. That means to have a change of mind about your sin and rebound. Acknowledge your sin to God. Therefore behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I keep on knocking is the actual translation. This is warning discipline. If anyone hears my voice, that means they are motivated to rebound from the warning discipline. And he opens the door. Opening the door is the function of rebound. I will enter face to face with him. This is restoration of fellowship with the Lord and returning to life inside of the spiritual life. And I will dine with him. This is fellowship. Dining is used uh, when you say I'm going to have fellowship with some t someone. Uh, that might include going to a restaurant and dining with them. So this is fellowship with God through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And he with me. And this is Operation Z with emphasis on metabolization of Bible doctrine. So you might not know what post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation is, but we will get to that. Right now we're dealing with the milk of the word, and we'll get to the meat of the word once you're ready. So when Jesus Christ stands at the door and knocks, he is extending to us the invitation to rebound. So this is not a salvation reverse. This refers to a post-salvation experience, which we will call rebound. The wrong invitation is blasphemous, for it becomes salvation by works. It adds something to faith in Christ. The wrong invitation is defined as inviting Jesus Christ to come to you. However, in salvation we go to Christ through believing in Him as per His call and His invitation. There is no salvation by inviting Jesus Christ to come to us. The wrong invitation is divided into two general categories which are practiced today. And those who practice this are not saved. The first is inviting Christ into your heart and the second is inviting Christ into your life. The next thing we uh, noted is public acknowledgement of Christ. This is a verbal work. And this is a misunderstanding of Romans 10, 9 through 10. Acknowledging Jesus Christ as Savior, therefore, is a result of salvation. It is not the means. And therefore, we have a confusion of means and result. And this has given the wrong impression to many, many spiritually dead persons as to the conditions for salvation. The Holy Spirit and His ministry of efficacious grace only causes faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ to be effective for salvation. The omnipotence of the Holy Spirit does not make verbal works an effective part of salvation. If you are mute and you cannot acknowledge Christ as your Savior with your mouth, does that mean you're not saved? Of course it, it does not mean that. Energy of the flesh has never saved anyone. And moving your lips and saying something is energy of the flesh. We are saved by simple faith alone in Christ alone. 
Commitment salvation is also closely related to verbal works. It is putting the cart before the horse. Commitment confuses the salvation work of Jesus Christ on the cross with the believer's dedication as noted in Romans 12.1. Therefore, it makes Romans 12.1 and similar commitment passages a condition for salvation. However, commitment is actually a function that occurs after salvation. So distinction must be made. We must rightly divide the word of truth between the man date for salvation, which is faith alone in Christ alone, and commitment, which is actually a number of decisions made after salvation. When commitment is added to faith, there is no salvation. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and efficacious grace does not make commitment effective for salvation. Lordship salvation is actually another verbal work in which recognizing the Lordship of Christ is added to faith. This false system of salvation uses a false epigram which states, If Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. This statement is blasphemous in that it ignores completely the Lordship of Christ as a result of the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus Christ was Lord in eternity past. We can't make him Lord. He was Lord in eternity past. He is Lord now and he will always be Lord. The moment we believe in Christ, the baptism of the Spirit enters us into union with Christ. Therefore we share in his Lordship and therefore he is our Lord. Whether we know it or not is not the issue. He is our Lord whether we know it or not. You do not make a commitment of Lordship for salvation. That will cancel your salvation. No one can make Christ Lord. Only God the Holy Spirit can do that. And this is accomplished by the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit must never be confused with the salvation ministry of the Holy Spirit and efficacious grace. Logically, efficacious grace comes first. Lordship salvation is salvation by works and therefore is not salvation. The spiritually dead person does not have the ability to make Christ Lord of anything. All he can do is believe in Christ. And then God the Holy Spirit will make his faith effectual for salvation. The volition of the spiritually dead person cannot make Christ Lord or make any commitment. Now we will note as we continue in the study, this is something we haven't noted and we're going to get to now, and that is ritual works. Ritual works include water baptism, circumcision, or the observation of the Eucharist as a requirement for salvation. Most common in this category is baptismal regeneration or salvation through faith plus water baptism. When water baptism is added to faith, there is no salvation because the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit cannot and does not make water baptism effective for salvation. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in efficacious grace makes faith in Jesus Christ and faith alone efficacious or effective for salvation. The next point, point five, salvation by morality is legalism, and salvation by keeping the law is Judaism, and interesting, interestingly enough, there are people who claim to be believers who are both involved in legalism, being, meaning you can only uh, be saved if you are moral, and in Judaism, meaning you have to keep the law if you're going to be saved. Morality is... Is, now these are some very important points that we're going to make after this point five. And that is that morality is something the spiritually dead person can accomplish on his own as a spiritually dead person. Therefore, salvation is obviously, obviously not part of salvation. Therefore, salvation is obviously not part of, or is not by, excuse me, morality Anything a spiritually dead person can do, this is extremely important and I think you should write it down. Anything a spiritually dead person can do is not a part of salvation. A spiritually dead person can be moral. In fact, there are many moral Judaizers. Many people who are Jews, very moral, understand the laws of divine establishment, yet they are destined for hell. There are moral Muslims, yet they are destined for hell. There are moral people who practice Hindu, yet they are destined for hell. There are moral people who practice Buddhism, 
Buddhism, yet they are destined for hell. Morality is something that the spiritually dead person can accomplish either on his own or through keeping the Mosaic Law or through adherence to the laws of divine establishment. Anything a spiritually dead person can do is not a part of salvation. For the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in efficacious grace takes faith and faith alone and makes it effective for eternal salvation. Romans 3, 20 through 22 Because by the works of the law... No flesh shall be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that's the title for the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Notice it says believe. It does not say invite Christ anywhere. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 4.4 4, Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are not calculated on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. <coughs> Excuse me. The harder you work for salvation, the further you go from it. You're only digging a hole that gets deeper and deeper. The more works you add to salvation, the deeper into the hole you go. Your works are not calculated on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. Therefore, Romans 4, 5, But to him who does not work for salvation, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith receives credit for righteousness. In other words, you must believe and only believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. But to him who does not work for salvation, if you work and try to believe, you are not saved. This is what it says, but to him who does not work for salvation, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith receives credit for righteousness. Romans 4.14 For if those who are by means of the law, that is, keeping the law for salvation, are heirs, then faith has been made void and the promises of God have been canceled. This verse is stating what I've been telling you, that the only thing God the Holy Spirit can make effective for salvation is faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And if you add anything to faith, it cancels out, makes void, the promises. Let's note this verse again. This is what I've been telling you under common and efficacious grace that if anything is added to faith it cancels out faith and you are not saved. And you might have thought I was making this up. Well here it is. It's plain as day. Romans 4.14 For if those who by means of the law are heirs, then faith has been made void and the promises have been canceled. Therefore adding anything to faith at the point of your believing in Christ means that you are not saved because you have not just believed in Christ you have added something to it and adding something to faith means you have canceled faith and you have made void all the promises which means you have no eternal life it's faith alone in Christ alone when keeping the law i.e. Judaism for salvation or any other system of morality is added to faith in Christ that faith is voided and nullified The omnipotence of God, the Holy Spirit, makes only faith in Christ effective for salvation. Anything added, such as keeping the law or morality, cancels faith. Galatians 2.16 Nevertheless, knowing that a spiritually dead person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed, Don't believe, not invite Christ anywhere, not invite him into your heart, not invite him into your life, not commitment, not lordship, none of these things. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Romans 5.1 Therefore being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation by morality or keeping the law is legalism and blasphemy. In fact, morality is not even the Christian way of life. Virtue from the God the Holy Spirit is the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life is a supernatural way of life and demands a supernatural means of execution. Only God the Holy Spirit can execute the Christian way of life. Virtue includes morality, but it is infinitely superior. Morality not being part of the Christian way of life, but the filling of God the Holy Spirit means that something greater is produced. Anything the unbeliever can do is not part of the Christian way of life. Anything the unbeliever can do is not the way of salvation. Salvation by emotion Emotion alleges salvation through feeling saved, or salvation through ecstatics, or emotional activity. This is blasphemy of adding emotion to faith for the validity of faith. Okay, therefore, we're on point six now. We just complete completed application from point five. Point six, salvation by emotion alleges salvation through feeling saved, or salvation through ecstatics, or emotional activity. This is blasphemy of adding emotion to faith for the validity of faith. However, the validity of faith in Christ comes from God the Holy Spirit. Never from emotion. You see, emotion is a part of our body. And we note this because if we uh, get some type of, let's say, we drink too much alcohol, what happens? Uh, we have a sense of feeling good. Our emotions, our body is stimulated by the alcohol. Actually, it's depressed by it. But, uh, in other words, our inhibitions are depressed. But as a result, we have a sense of feeling good. And just because you feel good, you can say, Woohoo, I've had six beers and I feel saved. That does not mean salvation. Feeling saved does not mean you are saved. You are saved simply by faith alone in Christ alone. And it doesn't matter if you feel awful. It doesn't matter if you're on a hospital bed dying of cancer in the worst pain you've ever been in. If you believe in Christ, you're saved. And it doesn't matter how you feel. The emotions of the spiritually dead are not effective for salvation. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and efficacious grace makes faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ effective for salvation. The Holy Spirit does not make any form of emotion effective for salvation. No one is ever saved because he says he feels saved. Furthermore, no one is ever saved by speaking in tongues or having the alleged second blessing that they use in holy roller churches around the area. It, or the second uh, blessing, which they, and they say this is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and these are lies. Neither emotion, nor feeling saved, nor a rosy glow experience, nor weeping tears of repentance at the altar. Esau wept for salvation and yet did not receive it. You can't weep for salvation, nor speak in tongues for salvation. It is not a condition and it is not a part of salvation. Belief, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now after you believe in Christ, you might realize and have an emotional uh, experience. You might realize that, wow, I have eternal salvation. I could have died and went to hell, but I'm not. By the grace of God, I'm going to heaven. And you might shed a tear over that, or you may not shed a tear over that. That is not the issue. The issue is whether you have believed in Jesus Christ or not. The principle, therefore, is that emotion is not a valid spiritual experience, either in salvation or in spirituality. The emotion in the body is designed to be a responder to things that you enjoy. But you must never confuse that with the fact that you need some type of emotion to be saved. You do not. Now I had I'm not telling you to be stoic. I'm not telling you never to have emotion. Definitely not. I have emotion. Every time I hear the Star Spangled Banner, a, a tear uh, wells up in my eye. But just because a tear wells up in my eye during the Star Spangled Banner has nothing to do with whether or not I'm saved. Of course not. Whether or not I'm saved has to do with, with whether or not I believed in Jesus Christ. And I believed in Jesus Christ at the age of five and I had no emotional response from it. But I'm still saved because I believed in Christ. 
Emotion in the body is designed to be a responder to things which we enjoy, and you must never assume that emotion has a spiritual connotation. You may get emotional over understanding spiritual things, such as grace. However, that emotion does not constitute the spiritual function of your life. It is merely a response to the spiritual function of your life. In itself, it does not indicate the feeling of God, the Holy Spirit. It does indicate, however, appreciation. How you feel, therefore, is inconsequential in salvation. The gospel does not emphasize how you feel. It emphasizes who and what Christ is. Being spiritually dead, there is nothing we could do to impress, impress God. When we believe in Christ, how you feel is not important. It's what God has done for you that is important. You may have an er emotional response to your salvation, or you may feel terrible. That in itself makes no difference. Now point seven, after we just had an application from point six, we're moving on to point seven. And this is corporate works. Many people believe that you must have some type of corporate work in order to be saved. And what is a corporate work? Corporate works are those things we add to faith in Christ, such as joining a church. Now, we understand that you don't have to go to church to be saved. In fact, you could be watching television, uh, maybe you're watching Billy Graham, and you hear that you believe in Christ, and you will be saved. And you hear that, and therefore you believe. And you've never been to church, and you never plan to ever go to church. Well, the moment you believed in Christ, you're saved. And you do not have to join a church for your salvation. The second thing, they say, well, in order to be saved, uh, you must tithe. And also that carries on over into the spiritual life. They say in order to be spiritual, you must tithe. Now we understand that tithing has nothing to do with the church today. We understand that tithing was an income tax in Israel. Now, if uh, people were saved by tithing, the people of the United States would be saved three times over, especially if you make a lot of money, because if you make a lot of money, the the, the rate is uh, thrice. It's uh it's not tithing, it's thricing. You have a, you pay 36% of your income to the government, and that's just on a federal level. And then if you have a state income tax, such as here, it's 7% state income tax up until a point, and uh, therefore... Uh, that would be uh, four. So then you're uh, quadrupling the, the tithe. So in Israel, tithing was a 10% across the board income tax. Had nothing to do with giving to the church. There was no church in Israel. And besides, we don't live in Israel. We live in the United States. And when and at church, now a lot of uh, pastors around this area will tell you you must tithe. And if you tithe, you'll be blessed. Well, these people are money grubbers. Some of them might even know better, but they like to see the money pour in. Well, I'm telling you right now, I'm not interested in your money. Not at all. I don't care about your money. I'm here to give out the word of God. Another corporate work is being baptized or taking communion. Now in baptism, of course, there was John the Baptist. He was not a Baptist, by the way. But uh, John the Baptist uh, baptized people. This was to show uh, the result of salvation. This was uh, a ritual used in the pre-canon era of the scripture. It is not needed now. And in fact, Paul wished that he had never baptized anyone. That's found in 1 Corinthians. Now that the canon of Scripture has been complete, we do not need baptism as a ritual to show us the redemption, to show us what it means to be identified with Christ. That's what baptizo means. It means to be identified. And now that we have the full canon of Scripture, we do not need this as a teaching aid. We do need a pastor-teacher, however. And taking communion, of course, is another one that is not needed for salvation. In other words, corporate salvation is salvation associated with the activities of a local church. In efficacious grace, God the Holy Spirit makes faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ effective for salvation. Efficacious grace does not include church membership or tithing for salvation. 
Point eight, there are psychological works. Now, psychological works allege salvation through raising your hand during a prayer, coming forward, walking an aisle, weeping tears of repentance at an altar, making a public declaration of faith, or jumping through some other psychological hoop. These activities show absolutely no understanding for grace. For grace says you can be saved only through faith alone. All of these are added to personal faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And when they are, they cancel out faith. The omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit makes only faith in Jesus Christ effective for salvation. Now evangelists will say, or they'll make up an excuse and they'll say, well, I want to know how many of you are saved so that uh, I can guide you to a, a local church. This is baloney. This is blasphemy. Once you're born again, once you believe in Christ, if you seek out doctrine, if you're positive toward the Word of God, God will send you to the milk of the Word. Now, the water of the Word is uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The milk of the word, well, the baby believer's desires the milk of the word. And then we have the meat of the word, which is for the spiritually mature. The emphasis today has been on the human rather than being on the work of Christ on the cross. So what they really do is they make an excuse, raise your hand so that we know if you're saved or not and we can guide you to a local church. This is not true. What happens is they want you to raise their hand so that they can go brag to their other to someone and say, Hey brother, last night at the sermon, five hundred people came to Christ. 500 people got saved, raised their hand, walked the aisle. 500, brother. Oh, praise God. 500. And the other man, he's wanting to one-up the other evangelist, so he lies and says, oh, brother, that's where we get the term evangelistically speaking. You know, we're at an elevation of uh, 1,600 feet, of evangelistically speaking. Actually, we're at about 1,000 feet. So, the, the uh, second evangelist says, uh, Oh, brother, amen, amen. I took 800 people. I, I led 800 people to the Lord. Gracious grace. Regeneration is the creation of the human spirit to which God imputes eternal life. Point nine. Roman Catholic salvation. Now, there are not very many Roman Catholics in our area, but if you go up uh, to the northeast, it's pretty much all Roman Catholic. Or if you go down uh, near the border with uh, Mexico, such as California and Mexico, or Texas and Mexico, uh, you will see there's a lot of Catholic influence there due to uh, the Hispanic influence, who are mainly Roman Catholic. So Roman Catholic salvation adds work works to faith in Christ. Salvation, according to the Roman Catholic faith, is not salvation. Now, you might ask a Roman Catholic when you add, you say, uh, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you? And the Roman Catholic will say, well, yes, I am. So, hence, you walk away believing that this Roman Catholic is saved. But, you have to understand that if you were to say, well, uh, Mr. Roman Catholic, if you do not uh, indulge in a system of penance, if you do not get baptized, are you going to go to heaven? And then the Roman Catholic will say no. And then you will say, but you just said you believed in Christ. And they will say, I do believe in Christ. But in order to be saved, you must also be baptized. You must also uh, do 50 genuflexes in front of an altar. Well, this is not the way of salvation. This is adding works. And therefore, as we noted, it nullifies the promise. The Roman Catholic Church believes in purgatory, which they call an intermediate state after death just designed for ex, 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 uh, ex, excuse me, expiatory purification especially from venal sins, that is, uh, sins capable of being forgiven. This is, what, this is their lingo. And uh, many people light candles at masses for the dead so that they can get out of the state of purgatory. Now, uh, this, of all things, of course, is works. And uh, many 
Roman Catholics, however, you might uh, meet a Roman Catholic who has not depended upon penance for salvation. They have not depended upon baptism for salvation. They have not depended upon anything except faith alone in Christ alone. And I have run into a few of those who have actually, uh, well, they claim to be Roman Catholic because their parents were Roman Catholic. And at some point, they simply believed in Jesus Christ. They just never had their title of Roman Catholic taken off. So therefore, uh, these people are truly saved because they have simply believed in Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic view of purgatory, mortal sins, and penance forms a system of ecclesiastical works which nullifies faith in Jesus Christ. The ministry of God the Holy Spirit in efficacious grace makes faith alone in Christ alone effective for salvation. One of the 40 things you receive at salvation is eternal life. Therefore, you do not have to practice a system of works to ensure or regain your salvation as alleged by the Roman Catholic Church or many other Protestant churches. Therefore, therefore, some Roman Catholics are saved because some at the point of uh, their faith alone in Christ alone were saved and it was totally apart from any ritual or penance that is imposed upon them by the Roman Catholic Church. At the moment they believe in Christ totally apart from the works of the Roman Catholic Church they receive eternal life plus 39 irrevocable things. The Roman Catholic belief that believing Christ died for their sins on the cross, followed by adherence to penance, indulgences, <clears throat> to get into heaven, is not salvation. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The practice of any form of works is contradictory. Therefore, faith is nullified by these works. The reverse invitation is not salvation. The correct order of evangelism is as follows. Someone communicates the gospel. Under the ministry of common grace, God the Holy Spirit makes only what is accurate and lucid understandable. Then follows the divine invitation of God the Father to believe in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. For example, you could go to a, an evangelistic meeting and there could be a lot of inaccuracies in the evangelist uh, message. But if you are positive at the moment of gospel hearing, as soon as that evangelist says something such as, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, God the Holy Spirit will make that lucid and perspicuous to you as someone in spiritual death. And therefore, then follows the divine invitation of God the Father to believe in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. The invitation from God the Father is taught in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him. God the Father draws by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in making the gospel clear. Notice we do not draw upon the Son. The invitation from God the Son is found in John 10:27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give to them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. And that indicates eternal security because you can never be snatched out of the hand of our Lord. Finally, in efficacious grace, the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit makes faith in Christ effective for salvation. So in salvation, the spiritually dead person comes to Jesus Christ through personal faith in Him, plus nothing. Therefore, in principle, the spiritually dead come to Christ for salvation, not the reverse. The spiritually dead person does not invite Christ to come to him. We noted the two categories of reverse invitation as blasphemous works, inviting Christ into your heart or inviting Christ into your life. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Furthermore, the ministry of God the Holy Spirit and efficacious grace is limited to faith alone in Jesus Christ, making only that faith effective for eternal life. In salvation, the spiritually dead person accepts the salvation invitation of God to believe in Christ, and you believe once. The first time you believe in Christ is the moment you have eternal salvation. 
in salvation, Jesus Christ, does not accept your invitation. Your invitation is works. And Titus 3, 5 tells us, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Romans 5, 12 now other people say uh, you have to invite Christ into your heart. Romans 5.12 answers that. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so spiritual death passed upon all men because all have sinned. In other words, how can you invite Christ into your life when you are spiritually dead? Dead people cannot and do not give out invitations. The imputation of Adam's original sin to the genetically formed old sin nature at the moment of birth results in spiritual death, which means these three things. You have total depravity due to our old sin nature, total separation from God, total helplessness to establish a relationship with God on the basis of anything we do, such as human works or anything else. Inviting Christ into your life is tantamount to inviting him into the total depravity of spiritual death. It's like inviting Christ into a tomb. The spiritually dead person cannot invite Christ into his life or anywhere else. Therefore, inviting Christ into your life is not salvation. <clears throat> now let's look at our Lord's utterance, Tetelestai. Tetelestai. The second reason, this is the, under the second reason. We just went through the first reason of uh, works. Let's go through the to the uh, second reason, which is Tetelestai. The second reason for the fact that salvation is by faith plus nothing is the statement of our Lord on the cross immediately after he was judged for the sins of the world. So you see Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the cross actually his hands were extended out like this and the nail went through his hands and the bones separated. They did not break as in prophecy it states they did not break but the nail went through the hands separating the bones and pulling upon through here upon these tendons extraordinarily painful in the hands and in the feet and not as the Roman Catholics show him uh, with ropes around him which would relieve some of the pain absolutely not Jesus Christ was on the cross and he said not a word not up until the point when our sins were being poured out on him and judged billions and billions of sins being poured out on Jesus Christ and judged and that's when he said Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani my God, my God why have you forsaken me and he was forsaken for you and for me and he made that statement so that we would understand the extraordinary agony of the judgment of our sins upon our Lord as he suffered spiritual death on our behalf and therefore and, and when all of this was completed our Lord while he was still alive said Tetelestai and that means finished in the past with the result that it stands finished forever it is finished is what we have in um, in the English uh, translation but it is better translated finished in the past with the result that it stands finished forever therefore when Jesus had received the wine this is John 1930 therefore when Jesus had received the wine he said Tetelestai and then he pushed his head forward and delivered over his spirit to God the Father now tetelestai means he finished the work on the cross and there is nothing left for us to do except the non-meritorious action of believing in Christ in tetelestai it tells us that Jesus Christ did all the work and there is nothing left for us to do and to add to the work of Christ on the cross is to say that Christ did not do enough and by doing so you are blaspheming the very work of Christ on the cross you can take zero credit for your faith and by adding anything to your faith and salvation that means you are in competition with God and that means no salvation for you and you are in fact in blasphemy now let's take a look at the direct statement of scripture 
We can note from the direct statement of Scripture that it's faith alone in Christ alone. John 16, 8-9 When He, God the Holy Spirit, comes, He will convince or convict the world concerning sin. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Our personal sins are not the issue at salvation. Only one sin, and that is the sin of rejection of Christ. That is the one sin Christ did not die for on the cross, and that is the sin of rejection of Him. And that is because they do not believe in Me. Concerning the sin, that because they do not believe in Me, our personal sins are not the issue because they were judged on the cross. The one sin He convicts us of is the sin for which Christ could not die, and that is the sin of rejection of, of Him, the sin of unbelief. John 3.15 That everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Notice it does not say believe and be baptized. Notice it does not say believe and do some type of work. Notice it does not say invite. Do you know that the word invite, the verb, the verb invite is not used once in Scripture. Not used in the Old Testament, not used in the New Testament. Thousands and thousands of pages of the Word of God, and the word invite is not used. So why are people using it today? They're adding to the Bible. They're adding to Scripture, and they're adding to salvation, and that means many people are not saved. John 3.16 For God loved the world so much that He gave His Son, the unique one, in order that anyone who believes in Him shall never perish. Notice that word. That is eternal security. You will never perish, but have eternal life. John 3.18 He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. Notice believe is repeated three times in this verse. No works added. No invitation on our part. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The issue in salvation is whether you believe in Christ, is whether or not you are going to believe in Christ once, or if you never believe. John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. John 11:25. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. John 11:26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now why does it say live? Because you only get one chance to believe in Christ. And that is while you are alive. So everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now once you die, your chance for salvation is over. And this reminds me of a time when I was in high school young man named Todd. He uh, played in the symphony along with uh, I was his classmate in the symphony and one morning after class Todd came up to me and he uh, basically gave me the gospel and I politely told the young man I said I've already believed in Christ thank you anyway. And he turned around and said okay and he walked on to class and on the back of his shirt it said I run to cross. I run to the cross whatever that means. I'm not sure but it's probably something he was doing with this church. But I do know, do know that this young man had believed in Christ and I do know that this, this young man was saved and while he might have not known much about the scripture he was still saved and he was going to go to heaven and therefore later in that, that day later in the afternoon a freak thunderstorm came up now I decided to stay in the in the symphony room and I uh, practiced my violin um, while the storm went on until the storm passed over because I wasn't about to go out and uh, drive in that mess. And so finally I got to go home once the storm passed. And uh, the next morning, my mother showed me the obituaries because someone had passed away and they were for, from Dorman. And there was a picture of Todd. Todd had passed away that day because he had gotten in his new truck and was on his way home when the freak thunderstorm hit. And the downpour was so heavy, he uh, hydroplaned over here on uh, Reedville Road, hydroplaned right into the other lane and hit someone head on and he died shortly thereafter at the hospital. So therefore, we do not know how long we're going to live. This man, young man, was 17 years old, very handsome. Uh, the women loved him, and he loved the women, and you can't blame him for that. So he was a very handsome young man, 
and his life was taken at the age of 17 and he went to be with the Lord because he had made the choice to believe in Jesus Christ. So therefore, while you're alive, you can make that choice. But once that time passes by which you're alive and you pass into death, then you, you no longer have that chance. You have missed that chance. And if you've not believed in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. And it's as simple as that. So while you're alive, you need to make that decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue uh, with uh, <clears throat> John twenty thirty one. John twenty thirty one. But those who have, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His person. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if anyone in your household believes in Christ, they too are saved. Notice that the command is to believe with nothing added to it. Galatians 3.26 For you are all the children of God by faith. Faith. Notice that. In Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. In other words, everyone is same, saved the same way. Whether Jew, Gentile, black, white, it doesn't matter your race, we're all saved the same way. And uh, God makes no distinction in his grace policy when it comes to race. And if you're a racist, you have a long way to go in your spiritual life. There is no room for racism in the Christian way of life. And that's just an aside. Uh, no extra charge for that. They are saved not by keeping the law. They are saved not by inviting Christ into their heart. They are saved not by commitment. They are saved not by dedicating themselves this Sunday and then dedicating themselves the next Sunday. They are saved only by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and notice it is the power of God that saves, not our power. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, also to the Gentile. Romans 3, 20 through 22. Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that is the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are calculated not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. And we already noticed that, noted this verse earlier. Romans 4, 14. For if, for if those who by means of the law are heirs, then faith has been made void, and the promises have been canceled. And we noted that concerning uh, common grace and efficacious grace. Galatians 2.16 Nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. How are we therefore justified in the eyes of God? Romans 5.1 Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course Ephesians 2.8 and 9 For you have been saved by grace through faith. And this salvation is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The only way of salvation is one act of personal faith in Jesus Christ with nothing added to it. To add to faith in Christ for salvation means no salvation at all. If when you believe in Christ you are depending upon something else besides faith in Christ, you are not saved. Philippians 3, 9 And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God 
on the basis of faith. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood what you have known the holy scriptures which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Even if you later renounce your faith in Christ you are still saved. This is per 2 Timothy 2.11-13 That's right, you can become faithless and still be saved. 2 Timothy 2.11-13 Faithful is the word, for if we, if we have died with Christ, and we have, this is called retroactive positional truth, we shall also live with Christ. If we endure, that means suffering for blessing, then we will reign with him. Those are the eternal blessings. Those are the blessings of which we might rule with Jesus Christ in the millennium. If we deny him, he will deny us. Now this does not mean he will deny us salvation because we are in union with Christ. He will not deny us our salvation. This is a deny. This is uh, the Lord denying us our escrow blessings for time and eternity. This means we will not receive the blessing of of uh, being a king in the millennium, of ruling in the millennium. This means our crown of righteousness, our crown of glory will be taken away. But it does not mean our salvation will be taken away. Because right after that it says, If we do not believe, this is after we are saved, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. God the Father cannot deny the indwelling of the Trinity. Therefore, there is eternal security. John 5, 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the dep deposition that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe this, who believe in the person of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And this, of course, is another statement of eternal security. Salvation is said to be by grace, Romans 3, 24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Grace excludes all human works, Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are credited, not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. But to him who does not work for salvation, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Romans 4.16 For this reason, it is by means of faith, in order that it might be on the basis of grace. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. And it is a very peaceful thing to know that we are saved simply by faith in Christ. And it is good to know that our burden is not to uh, go through some system of works on our part in the energy of our stupid flesh. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Romans 5.15 But the free gift of salvation is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression one man many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Romans 5.17 For if by the transgression of one, that is, Adam, in, that is Adam, spiritual death reigned through one, Adam, much more those who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through that one. Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 6-7 Resulting in the praise of the glory of His grace, by which grace He has graced us out in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. 2 Timothy 1, 8-9 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of His prisoners, to join with me in suffering with reference to the gospel on the basis of the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, that is the divine call, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which He has given to us, 
in Christ Jesus from all eternity past. Hebrews 2.9 We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the sake of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death as a substitute for all. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the next few moments are devoted to those who are here without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life. If you have not made the greatest decision of your life as Todd did, if you have not believed in Christ, then you are without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life. Therefore, these next few moments, you have the right to make a decision in the privacy, in your own privacy, to make a decision as to whether you want eternal life. And eternal life to you is as close to you as your simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you wish to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you may simply say, Father, I believe in Jesus Christ. And you can do this inaudibly, in your mind only. And that will be the moment of your eternal salvation. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to study the most basic yet the most important part of the Word of God, and that is our very own salvation. May the things that we note be a source of blessing and challenge to us, and may it be a challenge to us so that we might come to have a deeper understanding of grace, even from this milk of the Word. We have received the water of the word, then we are receiving the milk of the word. And may we grow in grace and in knowledge so that we can one day come to receive the meat of the word. Therefore, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. May these things be a source of blessing and challenge to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.